Texas. So uh, the topic I would like to address, um, which, which is actually something a lot of my fellow rabbis uh, have congratulated me for working on. You know, quite often we talk about uh, studying Torah and fulfilling mitzvahs, which of course is, is a, a part of our discipline and part of our, it is our entire life. I mean, even when you're running a business, the, it's, 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 it's a mitzvah because when you, when you give tzedakah from your income, when you employ people and give them a, a, a living, uh, you're fulfilling a mitzvah. So, but the, there's, there's, I think there's one topic, which, which interestingly enough, Chabad actually focuses on this topic heavily within our own studies in yeshiva. However, for some reason, and I, I actually presented this to the Jewish Learning Institute, and they said, well, this is way above what we plan on teaching. And that is the big old question of what is God? And I've been putting together uh, uh, more and more material uh, uh, to, you know, uh, help us understand how, how we, w when we use the word God in English, so much is lost. Every, every Hebrew word that is translated into, uh, into Hebrew, from Hebrew to English, a Hebrew word can impart hundreds of messages or at least multiple messages and teach us so many different things. And that's why, for example, if you open a translation of the Torah into English, right? You can open another 30 translations and they'll all have different translations. But guess what? They're all correct, most of them. You know, I, I, I mentioned uh, uh, so about three or four years ago, I was, I spent Shabbat at the Rebbe's resting place, you know, in the Chabad house next door. And I was looking for a Chumash to, uh, you know, to follow the Torah reading. And I pick up a Chumash and it happens to be that somebody must have taken it from a reformed temple and brought it to the Rebbe's, the Chabad house at the Ovel and left it there. So I open it up and I start reading the introduction. So I said to Rabbi Refs and Rabbi Abba Refs, I said, I got an education about a truth and the history of the Bible, God forbid, of course, like I never got before. And he, he got a good laugh out of that. But honestly, you look at the Torah and the Torah starts like this. And I, I'm, I'm sure you, you're, you're, you'll be somewhat familiar with everything that I say. The Torah starts with, in the beginning of God's creating heaven and earth. So first of all, in the, you know, anytime, go take any book, even the books that are behind Rabbi Smith over there. Um, and uh, if you take a look at, at the beginning of the book, the book gives you an entire description of what the book is about and who the author is. You know, I see Maimonides over there. I see uh, the Talmud. Uh, what's that? The Far Side? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, every book has its introduction. Torah has no introduction. It just starts in the beginning of God's creating heaven and earth. Who is God? The beginning of what? Is there a beginning for God? What is the beginning? So we translate this word, Bereshis, as the beginning. That's not what it means. And then we translate Elohim as God, right? So now you can, so it doesn't tell us who this Elohim is and translating it into God certainly doesn't do anything for us because the word God means just as much to us as the word Elohim, or maybe a little more if you don't speak Hebrew. So what is this? Uh, Elohim. Who is Elohim? Then if you keep reading the Torah, what does it say in the next chapter? In the in, it, When Hashem Elohim, it uses the name Yudke Vavke, the four-letter name, Hashem Elohim. Oh, 
So now you just told me that Elohim created the world. Now you're telling me that Hashem Elohim created the world. Okay. I still don't know who Hashem or Elohim is, but okay, at least I have some more information now. Keep going. Keep reading the Torah. You, and I'm going to skip all the way. First of all, God reveals himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then fast forward all the way to Exodus, to, to Shemos. What does Hashem say to Moses? I revealed myself to your ancestors with the name Kale Shakai, or, or the name Kale as we used to call ginger ale, we used to call it ginger kale. I don't know if you did that, Rabbi Smith, but kids still say things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so now he says, but I only revealed myself to your four, to the ancestors as kale shakai, but to you, I, but I, but to them, I never revealed my name, yud ke vavke, the four letter name. So wait a minute. So not only God has, two names, or three names, or four names. He, he's got a whole bunch of names. So what are all of these names? Did you ever think about that? So he actually, according to tradition, the Talmud tells us that there are seven names that we are forbidden to erase. I'm sure you're aware that when your when your 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 holy writings, if you have a Torah, and uh, you know it starts to fall apart or pages fall out, and they have the name of God on them, what do we do? We bury it in a cemetery, or under the ground. It doesn't have to be a cemetery. So there's now we know that God have set, has seven holy names, and as a matter of fact, those the the seven names actually have three other names that are are, are we're, we're we're meaning meaning the the three other names are included in the other seven so for example in the in the uh in the uh, uh in the psalms hashem is called kale chai so that's considered a separate name of god uh so so th there's really 10 names but the, you only need to know seven because the other three are included in the seven okay great so now that we know that God has all of these names, that still doesn't tell us who, who God is. So here's, here's, the, uh, here's the crux of, of the issue. We have God. God is defies description. And when I say God, I don't mean the name Elohim, the name that we generally translate as God. God, as we as as He exists in His essence, is defies description. You cannot you can't even say that God is kind, because that's a description. You can't say that God is great. As a matter of fact, when we refer to God in this His state of oneness of of of, tra of, of completely transcending the world, we don't use a name at all, not even the word God. We say, what do we say? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He. And when we make a blessing, first we say Baruch Ata. Who is Ata? What does Ata mean? You, who is you? It's a you that has no description. Then we say Hashem Elokeinu. We use names of God, but first we say you. So who is you? God as he transcends and defies description. So then what happens? An energy, a light, emits from God. This light, this, this, this light also so to speak, defies description. This, and by the way, we use the name light because that's what the, we only understand human terms. Tell us the great, uh, you know, 
super generated laser powered magneto hydrodynamic light of that we wouldn't not, that wouldn't help us anyway it's like calling to fill in phylacteries but you walk up to the average person and say phylacteries they'll understand it just as much as fill in so i don't even know who bothered translating it into phylacteries i want his name and phone number and his route to and from work by the way um so so there's it defies description so the sages called it an a light with no end However, it is a light with a beginning. That's what most people miss out. It actually has a beginning. It emanates from God. And by the way, even though we call creation ex nihilo, creation something from nothing, on a much lower level, that is actually a different stage in where the infinite or, or light without an end, a lot of people call it the infinite light. Uh, but really, the Hebrew term is a light without an end or ein sof. So this light emanates from God, but it also transcends description. Then that light enters what we call the four spiritual worlds. In the four spiritual worlds, that light first comes into any palpable, even spiritual existence. Once it enters a state where it can be given a description, then it is first called by the name Yudke Vavke, the four-letter name of God. As that light is further gradated and filtered down to the point that the physical can come to it into existence, on each level, it receives a different description. And therefore, in those levels, and there are 10 levels, the energy of God receives a different name. So it is simply Yudke Vavke, as we say daily in the Yishtaba, in the Baruch She'amar prayer. We say, Meshubach umefo'ar adei ad Shemo HaGadol. What is Shemo HaGadol, his, his greatest name, or his, his largest name? That is the name Yudke Vavke. So when you're saying Baruch She'amar, you're actually praising God all, all ten levels of godliness that descend through those gradations until they reach the physical world. And then we come into existence, the greatest obscurance of divine energy that exists. So now the question is, now that you understand why there are 10 names and why we call God HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God in his essence is not revelation. It is completely removed from us. And that is exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu means. He is holy. Holy means separate, completely separate from us. Baruch, blessed, also means separate. Who? Him. We don't know who, what. So we just say who? Him. Okay. Now that you might be floating about three inches in the air now, because as we get delve deeper into uh, descriptions of the divine, uh, it tends to do that. So now we have the number 10. So God gave us the number 10. We know that the world was created with 10 utterances. We know that uh, the, there are 10 commandments. So where does this number 10 come into existence from? So it's very interesting. There's actually a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot that asks that very question. Why was the world created with 10 utterances? Couldn't it have been created with one utterance? Why not? God can, and by the way, if you look at the Baruch She'amar prayer, it's extremely intense. You don't realize it because you just read through it like I do. I don't, how often do we think about it? But he says, blessed he is he who spoke and the world came into existence. Then it's, what does that mean? God, first of all, God didn't even actually speak. We use the word speech to say that we conveyed something from one person to another. God doesn't speak. He simply conveyed an energy from himself. So we call it speech. Then it says, blessed is he who says and does. 
we're not saying that God promises to do something and then does it. What we're saying is that as soon as something emanates from God, it already happens. So if you look at the, the, the Baruch Shamar prayer, it is far, far deeper than we realize on the, on the surface. So now let's get back to the question in the Mishnah. Why 10? Why not one? Why couldn't it have been created from oneness? So the Mishnah answers with an answer that will make you scratch your head. And it says, in order to punish the wicked who destroy a world that was created with 10 utterances and to reward the righteous who build a world that was created with 10 utterances. So how does that answer the question of why 10? So make it 20 utterances, make it 50, so you can punish the, the wicked more and, and reward the righteous even more. So now that you're scratching your head, first stop scratching. It's not good to scratch too much. So what is this, what is this uh, uh, number 10? Where does this number 10 come from? Why only 10? As a matter of fact, in Kabbalah, the sages and the, and the Zohar, the, uh, uh, the works of Kabbalah, they, dis, they debate and they, they state very emphatically that there's, and, and the Zohar says this, it says 10 and not nine, 10 and not 11. Why, why so much emphasis? What's going on? So we know that God doesn't create anything uselessly. So you can start to feel good about yourselves today. God only creates something that's absolutely necessary. So if he created 10, that means less than 10 was insufficient. And more than 10 is too much, too many. So why 10? So Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak, he was a, a great Kabbalist uh, in the 15th century. He was the teacher of the Arizal, who then, it's interesting because Rabbi Moshe Cordovero spent his lifetime or quite a bit of his life uh, refining and defining all of the teachings of a Kabbalist before him, and then his student comes along and creates a whole new system of studying Kabbalah. So Rabbi Moshe Cordovero explains like this, anything that exists, whether physical or spiritual, and by the way, God defies spirituality as well. To God, both the spiritual and the physical are all the same makes no difference to him whether you're 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 uh, whether you reach the top level of the of the top world spiritual world or whether you're a physical rock it makes no difference to god in his essence so anything even the spiritual has to have three dimensions it has to have a beginning an end and a core it has to have an inner core Therefore, and in Hebrew, it's rosh, toch, and sof. You have to have the beginning, the middle, and the end. Otherwise, it's nothing. It's nothingness. And nothingness doesn't exist. You know the story of the uh, rabbi on the high holidays was praying with great fervor. And he fell on the floor saying, God, please forgive me. I am dust and ashes. So the cantor, not to be outdone, sees the rabbi falling on the floor in such passion. And he says, God, please forgive me. I am not worse than dust and ashes. I'm not even the ashes of the ashes. Then the, the, uh, the, the local uh, uh, you know, uh, tailor sees the rabbi and the cantor. He is also overtaken by uh, passion. And he also falls down and he says, I'm not even ashes and, and dust. So the cantor turns to the rabbi and says, ha. Ah, Look who thinks he's nothing. So, but, but if something doesn't have three dimensions, it, it is nothing. So here is how the first existence comes into being. And this is why it actually has 10. And Hasidus, and Rabbi Smith can, can, can attest to this, uses the example of a teacher ad nauseum. Why? 
because it is the closest thing that we have in order to describe that that we can 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 understand and so to speak uh, you know relate to so a teacher in order to have knowledge a teacher has to receive the knowledge from somewhere else whether it's a book whether it's another teacher so he has to receive that has to be its own dedicated uh, implement the recipient core so to speak once he receives the core the once he receives the information then comes the second stage which has to be also its own core where he internalizes that knowledge it becomes a part of him but he's a teacher so therefore he has a third core and that third core is where he prepares the information not the way he understands it because a teacher's level of understanding is going to be higher than the student's understanding so he can't just teach it the way he understands it he has to shape and formulate it so that the student can understand it and only then can he use the tool of transmission and transmit it to the student however the job of the transmitter is not to manipulate the information it's simply to pass it on therefore it needs no existence it's ethereal so to speak and it passes it on it doesn't need to have a beginning middle and end it's a, it's a completely self uh, 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 self uh, uh, let's say uh, neglecting self rec it lacks any recognition of self so this is how the first core has to be created for spiritual energy. Spiritual energy might as well be the same thing as wisdom. Wisdom is also a spiritual concept. So the first level, the first core that receives divine uh, uh, energy or light, that core has to have three parts. We call it, because based upon the tradition of the Kabbalists, Chachma, Bina, and Da'at, which, by the way, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, of course, in the highest world, that means something completely different than our own personal Chachma, Bina, and Da'at, which, as you know, is the acronym for Chabad. So the first core has three parts, Rosh, Toch, and Sof beginning, middle, and end. We have three parts now. Then you have the internalizing. Internalizing involves the emotional and intellectual process. And that is another three-part core called chesed, gevura, tiferet. That is where the, 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 uh, le that particular set of Svirot internalizes the divine transmission. Then we get to the third core, which is also comprised of three parts, Netzach, Hod, Yesod. And those are, they are actually called a mirror image of the first three, and those are really the mirror image of, of the first three and even of the first part of the first core, because everything is really contained within the kernel of Chachma. Chachma, the first level, contains all ten. So it's a oneness that turns into ten. So now we have nine. We have each, we have three cores, and each one has three parts. What is the tenth part? The tenth part is called Malchut. It doesn't belong to a set. Malchut, and by the way, the moon is compared to Malchut. The, the, uh, the Kabbalah says, Sihara, the moon, has nothing of its own. What does that mean? It has no light of its own. The moon simply reflects the sun without changing the light whatsoever. And Malchut is also completely self-effacing. It has no sense of self. It is, a, it is simply a messenger that is nullified to God's will and transmits that which it receives 
to the next level in which the, the core of the next level begins, also needing only 10. So since only 10 are needed, therefore God created only 10. And not more and not less. So now, and, and by the way, uh, just I, I, I will, I will, uh, uh, I'll, I'll actually, you know, of course we know that it, it, we can't simplify the transmission of divine energy into simply four levels. There's myriads and myriads of levels through which the divine energy is, is gradated and is filtered down. And it's actually hinted to by King Solomon. People read King Solomon's readings and think, oh, this is such wonderful poetry. I'll take it to the next, you know, poetry reading. Um, King Solomon says, or, or I, I forget if, uh, I, I think he says, Vayedaber Shloishas Alafim Mashal. He speaks 3,000 parables. What does that mean? 3,000 parables? Not only are they 3,000 parables, but each parable is a parable to begin to understand the previous parable. What King Solomon is really saying is that in or you have to hear the last parable first. Then you get some understanding of what the concept is, but you, then you go need to go to parable two to get closer. And only when you go through all 3,000 parables and your mind becomes refined, then you'll be able to understand not just the 3,000th highest parable, but even the concept that the parable is describing. So that is how great God is that there are there we it, the 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 transformation of 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 energy into a lower energy all happens in the way that a parable breaks further down a concept so now let's go back to the mishnah so the mishnah says it could have been created with 1 why was it created with 10 and then punishing the wicked, rewarding the righteous. How, what is that, how does that affect it? So Rabbi Moshe Cordovero explains as follows. If the world had been created with oneness, there would only be oneness. And it is only, it is only because the energy, of the divine energy, is broken down in, in each level into 10 parts and then goes lower and lower until it reaches the physical world. And then you even have the ability, because it's broken into 10, you have the ability for the, the side of evil to receive any type of of transmission of divine energy. It's called a, 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 in, an insulin dog. The Arizal calls the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the feeding of the, where evil feeds off of, of, of God's energy is like an insulin dog that steals the scraps from the king's palace. And we sing it every Shabbos afternoon during the third meal. Hane kalbin da chatsifin. It's not talking about your neighbor's dog that barks all night. It's talking about that the the that the evil energy is uh, is is uh, it mooches and leeches off of the ten. And by the way, how is it possible for for uh, for evil to 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 grab divine energy? How does it happen? So first of all, be, if it's only one. There's no way to get anything from it. It's solid. But if you have 10 different parts that need to work with each other, and we as humans do, do things which causes the bond between those 10 to weaken, that is when energy can go the wrong in the wrong direction. That's the only way. If we let it happen. So if we, when, when we draw down God's energy, and it flows properly through the ten sefirot, the ten attributes in each level. Then they they are bonded together so tightly by the divine energy that there's no way for evil to leech off of them. 
But when we don't do what God wants, God isn't punishing us, by the way. It's we're punishing ourselves. I mean, if, if you plug your take a hose and run it from your exhaust pipe into your car, are you being punished with death? No, you're killing yourself. So when we do things against God's will and the bond between those 10 that filter down, down the divine energy is weakened, that is when evil is able to uh, 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 feed off of it, so to speak. So then let's go back to the Mishnah. If there was only oneness, there would be no possibility of evil whatsoever, but there would also be no possibility of free choice. Because if we're only exposed to God's energy without any filter that allows us to look at it and say, oh, I can go do whatever I want. I don't have to follow God's will. And I can still have a good relationship with God. Because people who do things against God's will, they don't say, I don't care about my relationship with God. They say, I know God will forgive me. So therefore, you know, I can go do whatever I want. God will still love me. And the Tanya speaks about it, how we fool ourselves. And, and by the way, my answer to such people is, you're right, God will understand. What, God doesn't know that man has temptation? He gave us temptation, of course he understands. So whether God will understand or forgive you, of course he will. Eventually everybody will, will repent and get forgiven. The question is, what are you going to say about yourself? God isn't going to have to ask you any, and me too, by the way. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I plead guilty. Guilty is charged. Put me in jail. But God is just going to stand there and look at you. And you're, 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 he's not going to say, oh, you owe me this, you owe me. He's just going to say, look, you, you made this mess. And you're not going to have all of your excuses. By the way, I have some good ones I can give you too for sinning. I'm, rabbis have the best excuses for sinning. So, so therefore, uh, it, it, we're punishing ourselves when we allow evil to, to to, to feed off of, of, of good. So therefore, God, that's the answer to the Mishnah, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero says, is if God created a world out of oneness, there would be no, no righteous people or, or, or evil people because they would all have no choice to be anything but good and they would be like the angels. But because God created the world with 10 utterances, and that's all, that's the minimum and maximum that is needed in order for man to ultimately have choice. Therefore, God is able to punish the wicked because they had a choice and they chose to do evil. And they only had a choice because God created it with 10 utterances, not one. And the righteous, they chose to do good because they had a choice and they chose the right thing. And therefore, because God created the world with 10 utterances, giving them the ability to do no good and they did good, therefore he's able to reward them. And I would like to give my, my last, uh, um, so to speak, uh, uh, parable. And th this is what I call the great movie theater. How, so, so how does God's energy come from this, 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 first of all, of course, when I use the word God's energy, uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm using a term that, uh, you know, uh, God's, I could, I could say God's petroleum, his kerosene, his uh, natural gas. Uh, you know, by the way, I, I made $4,000 10 years ago. They leased the land under my house. They paid me $4,000. Then the prices collapsed and I lost the lease on the Chabad house. So anyway, God helps in other ways too. As you can tell, I haven't missed any meals. Um, so, so this is how I describe it. God's light is without an end, right? We say a light emanates from God and it's without an end. Well, we can call it the infinite light, but it's not, in a sense, it's not infinite because it has a beginning. So first of all, if you have one infinity, can there be another infinity? The answer is no. Not only that, if there is an infinity, there is not even a speck of dust that exists independently of that infinity. And I'll tell you why. Because where that speck of dust begins 
infinity ends. So you can call it vast, you can call it huge, you can hold, call it the greatest thing that ever existed, but not infinite, because where that speck of dust exists, there is no more infinity. So therefore, only God exists, but we exist within the existence of God. And the way that I put it is like this. There are different dimensions. They all exist within each other. There's not God up there, here, everywhere. And, and, and as, as it, you know, sometimes they say everything you learned, you learned in kindergarten. Where is God in the bathroom? Right? So why do we say God, we can't take a mezuzah into the bathroom? Um, but God, does, so does God exist in the bathroom? So the answer is as follows. In this dimension, which we exist in, the space that the bathroom occupies, as far as God is concerned, doesn't exist. And only God exists. As a matter of fact, on a, the, we're, we're in, the, in the dimension where there's only God and one God, we don't exist either. However, in our dimension, this is the only dimension in which multiple revelations of godliness can exist at the same time. Therefore, a mezuzah is holy. But your shoes are not. Maybe your users, I think they're like $1,800. They can be holy. But uh, uh, I've never seen a pair in my life that I know of. But anyway, so the, the bathroom can be this holy, no holy, and the mezuzah can be holy, and therefore the mezuzah can't go into here. So you say, but, but isn't God everywhere? Yes, but in the dimension where God is everywhere, neither the mezuzah or the bathroom exist. So now let's go back to, so how do we exist if we're within the existence of God? If God is everywhere and right here, how can I even exist? So this is how I explain it. You have in a movie theater, what do you have? A powerful light, very, very powerful light. If you, and imagine, obviously, God can create the most powerful, immense light ever. If you stand in the room where that big light is, what are you going to see? Only light everywhere. Now, we put a film negative in front of that light. What happens if you stand on the other side of that film negative? What are you going to see? You're going to see an image projected on the wall. Now, you put another negative in front of that negative. So now the image gets distorted further. You put another film negative, another film negative, you put 10 film negatives. Then you put another set of 10 film negatives, the image changes, and by the time, here is the great light. Here are all of these film negatives. Here is the wall. If you stand here, all you see is the image. If you stand in between each of those film negatives, there's a different image in each one. So if you stand here, you don't even know that there's a light here. Of course, I told you already, so you know there's a light. Don't, don't give me that look. But, but if you stand here, all there is is one light. There's only one light, one God, nothing else. So basically, when you go watch a movie, you are a projected image sitting in this light, which is also a projected image. And if there's somebody watching a movie in the movie, then that's even further. <laughs> anyway, you get where I'm going with that. So therefore, we have we from God's perspective and God's essence, there is no world. There's oneness. The fact that we have all of and by the way, the, uh, this is interesting. The reason that if your kippa falls off, you can't just use your hand to cover your head is because you can't cover yourself. So God cannot cover himself. He can only cover the light from our perspective where we think, we believe that we are real. And God wants us to act as, as if we, we are real. And he wants us to live and manipulate the energy through Torah and mitzvahs in a positive way, obviously, in order for us to create the contrast. God wanted a world where this light is never seen or rarely ever seen 
because he wanted fallible human beings to choose because without us, this, the virtue of this light isn't seen. But when, when the light is obscured and we still choose to connect to it and the virtue of goodness is seen in the physical world, that's when the virtue, as, 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 uh, as King Solomon says, the virtue of light over darkness. If there's no darkness, then the light is useless. It's only when, or I shouldn't, God forbid to say God is useless, but it's, 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 it's not detected whatsoever. But the virtue of light is seen better in this physical world because it's so dark, because it's so obscure. So I have two more items that I want to say, and I think we have nine minutes left. Um, sometimes the greatest insight comes from the most unexpected places. A Christian man once called me and he said, I want to come talk to you. I have a lot of questions about uh, uh, Judaism. So I said, sure, come on over. He came over and uh, 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 I, I also said, you know, please don't bring any imaginary friends with you. But anyway, I digress. So he came. I didn't say that then. Um, so so he, we sat and talked. And I started explaining to him how Judaism is comprised of the written Torah and the oral Torah. Without, and I told him, without the oral law, we don't understand the written law. So he looks at me and he says, give me an example. I said, okay. The Torah said, so first I like asking this of people because they usually get the deer in the headlights look. Where in the Torah does it say that we should fast on Yom Kippur? So most people give up right away. I don't know, Rabbi, because they never even bothered reading through it. So I said, well, I'll educate you. It actually, all it says is on the 10th day of the seventh month, whenever that is, you shall afflict yourself, your soul. You shall afflict your souls. Doesn't say to fast. Now, the fact that the rabbi gives a speech definitely afflicts your souls. So, so that's, uh, that, you know, maybe that part is, is biblical. But actually, I explained to him that the oral law teaches that there's actually five prohibitions on Yom Kippur that Moses taught us. No eating or drinking. Um, no bathing. No intimacy. Uh, uh, no perfume. No, no wearing scents. And oh, the fifth one is no leather soles, no leather shoes. So the guy looks at me and he says, I just can't accept that God would care whether or not you were wearing leather shoes. So as I said, only God could have put the answer in my head because I, 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 there's no way that I came up with this myself. I said to him, do you think God would care or be affected if the entire world was destroyed by a nuclear explosion? So he looks at me like, you know, he didn't expect that question. And he says, you know, probably not. <laughs> How would it affect God? We're only an, uh, 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 um, we only sense our existence because God lets us sense it. Otherwise, it doesn't affect him. He exists and he's just fine without the world. So he, he says, no, I don't think God would care. I mean, it wouldn't affect him. So I said to him, so now you have to make a decision. Since God is, let's call God infinite, okay? Because God even defies the word infinity. That's because God can make the finite exist within the infinite or the infinite exist within the finite. He, by the way, he's the best magician. You should check out his YouTube channel. Anyway, so, uh, so, so I said to him, so since God does everything in an infinite way, we must say that God either cares infinitely or doesn't care infinitely. There's no two ways about it because everything he does is gonna be infinite. So here, for somebody who's finite, the number of one billion and, and one cent are so completely different that we would never, you know, in a negotiation over a property, nobody would offer a cent when somebody's offering one billion, right? 
And nobody would say, yeah, to me, having a penny in the bank or a billion in the bank is the same. Nobody would say that. Why? Because we are finite. And therefore, more is, is, is greater than less. But for God, who is infinite, there is nothing that can take any relevance whatsoever when you're infinite. So unless, unless God chooses to care infinitely, and therefore, at the same time that God cares about a nuclear explosion that destroys the world, a murder, or a leather soul, God can handle it. Don't He doesn't need your help either, by the way. And you know, there's the story of the guy who came to synagogue first on Yom Kippur morning, the first time in his life. And he sees everybody wearing white tennis shoes. And he's wearing fancy leather shoes. So he was embarrassed. So he decided to come back the first night of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Sukkot. And he wears his best white tennis shoes that he can find. And he sees everybody else is wearing fancy leather shoes. So he learned the hard way that you don't wear that, that what, what Yom, the day of Yom Kippur means. And, and by the way, a, a friend of mine once said to me, we were teenagers, he says, Dove, we all know that everything is really just a bunch of atoms and, and molecules, etc. So if I want to touch my girlfriend, it really doesn't mean anything because really it's all just a bunch of atoms touching each other. I said, you're right. And I said, this big knife I have right here is also just a bunch of atoms. So if I stick it through you, uh, by, I, by just uh, let me preface, I, I did not do that. Just I see people getting worried. So I said to him, if I stick this knife through you, it's also a bunch of atoms. I said, you can't have it both ways. Either you accept the reality that God created for us, or you don't at all. And I'll finish with the story of... Uh, uh, Rabbi Manus Friedman tells the story of somebody who, who didn't repay a loan. So he comes before the court and he says, listen, court, I don't know what they're talking about, $5,000, this, that. To me, everything is nothing. Nothing exists. All there is is God. Everything's nothing. So the court conferred and said, we rule that this man will receive 10 nothings on his nothing. 